Welcome to Antioch Baptist Church. We are so glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we would love to get to know you better. If you will fill out that visitor's card in the seat pocket in front of you and take it to the sign-up table when you leave service today. We have a gift for you. We'd love to get to know you better. Welcome. Be thank you for being here. Now, we've got several things that we're celebrating this morning. And uh, first of all, we want to celebrate with the farmers. Haley is here. Stand up, Haley, and the farmer's adoption is finalized. So hopefully you're getting a piece of cake to celebrate that. We're also honoring Memorial Day. We're remembering those who have served our country. And But before we honor them, we want to honor our graduates. Would our 2019 graduates come down to the front? Come on up here, Ellie. That's you. Yep. Come on up here. And y'all come down here to the middle and just give it up for them. We had the bulk, the bulk of our graduates were in the first service today. And so, well, we still want to honor them and we want to remember Savannah and Ellie and Drew. And we're so, we're proud of you guys. We want to let you know, I have some gifts for you. And inside these gifts is a very unique gift, I think. But it's a, let's see here. Ruining the, sorry, Christy made these, Christy made these so nice and I just ruined it, but that's okay. Inside these gifts, there's one of these old rustic keys, and I love stuff like this. And I want to talk to y'all about the key to successful life. You guys are starting a new chapter, all right? You're finally going out on your own. You're going out into the brave new world, venturing out, and you're going to explore, you're going to make an impact. But the key to keeping your faith is keeping your love for God. Your relationship with God is the most important relationship that you'll ever have. And there's so many, so many people at your age in life, when they go out, they get out, get away from mom and dad, they start to explore the world on their own, and they make some bad decisions, and they lose their faith. And I don't want that to be the story in your life. I want your relationship with God to get stronger and stronger every day. And the key to that is what Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Because this can't be something that your parents do for you. You have to invest in your relationship with God. You need to make a difference. You need to stand up for what's right. Your generation needs someone that will show them the love and that will stand for the truth. That's what your generation needs. That's what we're all depending on you for. And I want you to remember as you get out, sometimes you're gonna experience failure, you're going to experience doubt, fear. I want you to remember everyone that's here at Antioch Baptist Church is praying for you, loves you, and you remember you're never alone. You're surrounded by a family that is very proud and that loves you all very much. Would you stretch out your hand this way? I want to, oh, look at that. Turn around. You're getting a standing ovation, right? On key. On, first service didn't get that. You're special. You are special. Would you stretch out your hand as we pray over... The leaders of today, not just tomorrow, but of today. Lord, we thank you for Savannah and Ellie and Drew. We thank you for the plans that you have for their life. We thank you that you've handcrafted them. Lord, you have purposed their life to bring glory to you. We pray from this day forward that they would remember the key to not just enjoying this life, but to eternal life is through relationship with you. Lord, help them. Lord, if they're the only one that will stand for truth, give them the strength to stand. When everyone else in their age group is partying and making bad decisions, help them to remember the truth that they were taught. We pray that throughout their entire adult life, they would learn to grow and lean and, and, and just build that relationship with you. We're looking forward to seeing how they impact the world. Lord, give them the strength, give them the grace, give them the courage that they need to make a difference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Ellie, this is for you. Savannah, you already got a gift, but you could take one. Just, yeah, make sure you give it back, okay? You don't get to. I'm just kidding. Let's get up on our feet and let's worship the Lord.
Looking through the waters rise I can hear the howling glass on me Fear won't hold me now My feet are on the rock When I feel my hope about to break I will cling to your
the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, in darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice, how great
with everyone this morning to praise your name and to glorify you, Lord. Um, thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. I pray um, a blessing over the offering this morning, Lord. I pray that our hearts are in the right place as we give back to you what's already yours, Lord. And I pray that you bless it and you use it to further your kingdom, Lord. And I pray for all the things that will be done with it, Lord. I just pray for your um, guidance and just bless it, Lord. And we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, this weekend, for many of us, we'll get a day off tomorrow in the observance of Memorial Day. It's more than just a, it's more than just a four-day weekend. It's, it's a day, it's a time of remembrance where we remember that the freedoms we enjoy are the result of the sacrifices that have been made by those who've gone before us. Men and women through every branch of the military, all of our armed forces over the years have paid the ultimate price so that we can enjoy to live in a free country. You can drive whatever you want, wear whatever you want, go wherever you want, because there have been people that have given their lives for your freedom. And so before we move on with the service, I think it's very important that we take a time to honor those who have gone on, who have served our country and paid the ultimate sacrifice with a moment of silence. Would you just bow your heads with me? Lord, we thank you for the privilege that it is to live in America. We thank you for your blessing on this nation. Lord, we're proud to be Americans today. We're thankful, Lord, that this nation was founded by you founded on the truths in your word, founded for the purpose of reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for our country. We pray for our country. And Lord, we thank you for the service of those who have gone on before us in dedication, dedicating their lives to this great nation by giving their lives for it. We just pray for their families. We pray for all of our troops all across the world right now. And Lord, we thank you for the price that they're paying. Lord, we don't take it for granted. Lord, we ultimately honor you for paying the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom, for purchasing eternal life by sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, help us to live our lives in remembrance. Help us to take responsibility to do our part, to, to represent you and to be good citizens in your nation. We just pray that you would continue to bless America. And we thank you for all those who have given their lives to defend it. We pray your blessing on their families and we pray your blessing on this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. If you want to open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, that's in the New Testament, second half of the book, G-E, right, what is it? It's, it's after Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, it's after Philippians. It's in the New Testament, I know that. Second half of the book. Open up to the book of Colossians. We've been in a series called Life as Doxology, and we talked about, we started this series talking about the doxology. Many of us grew up singing, that y'all can just sit in the dark, just stay in the dark. I like it, I like that haze. Pete, if somebody could, wouldn't mind going to the back and hitting the lights, that'd be awesome. That way people can can come, come into the light. We're celebrating living in the light as Christians. Amen. I don't know who was on light duty, but boy, they are blowing it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to hear about that from whoever was. But, you know, it's fine. It's really, it's okay. No problem. We've been talking about living life as doxology, living our lives as an expression of praise to God. You grew up in church like I did, I'm sure, singing the old doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below, 
Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We've been talking about that should not just be a hymn. That should be the story of your life. And here's how we're redefining doxology. The, the, the definition is on the screen for you. Doxology should be an expression of praise to God, especially a life lived fully devoted to His service. Your life is a song to God. You're either worshiping God or you're worshiping something that is lesser than God. But we're all worshiping something. We were created and designed to worship. And, and we've been talking about how we need to move past this service and get into the world and live our lives in God's service. So I have a new definition of, of worship for you. I'm going to put it up on the screen. It, it, it's, I thought of this uh, late last night as I was meditating on my, on my notes and this is what came to me. It's, worship is more than exaltation. What we just did by singing how great is our God was exalt the Lord. That's, that's biblical. That's important. But it's more than that. It's more than just an encounter or an experience or an event. It is everyday life. Worship is everyday life. Paul said to offer your body as a living sacrifice. And that's what we talked about last week is worship while you walk. Worship as you live. Romans 12.1. See, there's no act of worship that will please God that is simply internal. It is not enough just to say, oh, well, I'm worshiping him in my heart. I'm worshiping him in my own time. I'm worshiping him in my own way. No, according to the scripture, you have to offer your body. Worship requires an outward action. But it also isn't enough to worship just outwardly. There are some people who are experts in just going through the motions and attending services and conferences. And, and we, 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 get it. we become really good at coming in here and lifting up our hands. But then when we leave, not so much. So it's not enough for it just to be inward. It's also not enough for it to be outward. Paul said to offer your body, not to conform to the pattern of the world, and to daily renew your mind. So it's the offering of your body, your mind, and your will. And if you submit your will to God, if you renew your mind by the word of God, and if you offer your body as an offering to God, your emotions will catch up eventually. It may take a while. It may take till about the third song. But somewhere in that action, it's going to catch up. And that's what it's about. Worship while you walk. And now I want to talk about a, a different area of life today. A major area of every one of our lives. We talked about worship while you walk. Today I want to talk to you about worshiping while you work. And we just had these lovely grads come down and we're celebrating that, uh, that with you. But now, guess what? Now you get to go get a real job. Now it's time for you to step out into the world. I'll never forget when I was 17 and I was heading down to Hampton, Virginia to master's commission and my dad pulled me in and said son your mother and I are so proud we've waited for this day for a long time and I thought he was going to follow with something very heartfelt or dramatic or you know and he said son now from this day forward all of your bills are officially yours bye-bye <laughs> have fun and he let me out and he shut the door and that was it it's like oh okay then all right I heard my mom sobbing in the living room he said oh don't worry about it. you still got one in the house let's go measure his room I want to put something new in there and they just kind of moved on but it, it is true. Now we all, we all will work. Did you know that you will spend the majority of your time awake on this planet engaged in work? The only thing you'll do more than work in this life is sleep. Most of the time that you spend in, throughout your everyday life will be spent in work. And so uh, I have some definitions of work. A work is how I define it is at any activity. It can be anything that involves mental or physical activity. That's work. Anything that you do that involves mental or physical activity. So you don't have to be working a nine to five job. You can be a stay at home mom and you will work. You can be married. Marriage is work. Some of you are like, I've been putting in overtime this week. We all know it's any activity that requires that. This is my day. This is Pastor Dave's dumbed down definition of work. Work is simply something you got to do. Not necessarily something you want to do. It's something that you got to do. And yes, that is a real word. G-O-T-T-A. You got to do whatever you got to do. Here are some synonyms for work. Labor, toil, exertion, effort, drudgery, the sweat of your brow, industry, service, grind, sweat, tasks, jobs, duties, assignments, commissions, projects, chores, elbow grease, and travail. That's work. And guess what? 
there's a lot of work to do. And so if you're going to spend the majority of your life engaged in work, you might as well learn to worship while you do it. You were designed to work. It is a way that you can use your God-given gifts and abilities and talents right where you are throughout the world to bring glory to God. So whether I don't care whether you're retired and now just working on your own schedule. I know a lot of people here, they say, now that I've been retired, I'm working harder than I've ever worked in my whole life. The only difference is you get to pick some of what you do, some of what you do. Whether you're retired, working at home, or at Wall Street, or on Main Street, or in the woods, or on the road, or at the bank, or the plant, or school, or an office, whether you're in a truck, or a company car, whether you're on a farm, or a fancy business suite, wherever you are, worship while you work. Some of us work too much, and then there's a lot of us, some of us, who probably work too little. But no matter how, when, or where, or what you do, when you do it, you should do it for the glory of God. We should learn to worship while while you work. Anybody remember Snow White? See, all all of my movies I watch are all kids' movies. Snow White had to clean up after seven smelly small men. And she learned to do it with a smile by whistling while you work. Well, we can do one better. Instead of just whistling while you work, we can learn to worship while you work. So let's look at Colossians chapter 3. Follow along in your Bible, or you could follow along up on the screen if you want to get on your feet. Anybody need a Bible? I've got some. Pretty purple ones for the ladies or fellas, if that's your thing. All right, okay, nobody needs one. Good, you brought your own. All right, let's read what the Bible has to say about work. Colossians 3, verses 16 and 17, and then we'll slide down to verse 22. It says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Verse 22 says, now bond servants, obey In all things, your masters according to the flesh. In other words, workers obey your boss. Not just with eye service. Not just when they're looking. Don't be like the man pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. You can be seated. No matter how you slice it, about a third of your life is going to be spent working. 30% of your entire life you're going to spend on the clock or doing some kind of task that you just got to do, not necessarily something that you want to do. So if that much of your adult life is going to be spent working, if the majority of your time is going to be spent employed or operating in some kind of service fashion, shouldn't you be worshiping while you do it? Answer is yes. But so often in our lives, we, we, we allow the drudgery of, of, of work to kind of bring us down. We go to work on Monday morning. Some of you are going to walk in and you're just going to be, oh, here we go. How you doing? Oh, you know how it is. Same stuff, just a different day. How are you doing? Well, it's just another day in paradise. These things that you say, and you say them sarcastically because you don't really want to be there. But listen, wherever you are, that's where God's put you. So you might as well glorify him. If you lift up your hands on Sunday and then go drop the ball on your job on Monday, how does that reflect on Christ? So you got to start thinking, all right? So how, how do we worship while we work? I'll tell you how. Verse 16, starting there, the first phrase, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Not the water cooler gossip. Not the Facebook chatter, not who won the ball game or who lost the ball game. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Because if that's what you fill your heart with, that's what will come out of your mouth. But here are some statistics for you. Did you know that 64% of American workers think their workplace has a negative effect on their personal well-being? That's sad. A negative effect. You're going to be there for the majority of your life. All right, 15, only 15% of employees polled in a recent Gallup poll, only 15% said they felt engaged while they worked. 
I, that means that the majority of people feel like they're just doing the same mundane, boring, mind-numbing tasks day after day, hour after hour. Listen, if you will get, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, you will stay engaged while you work. Because you realize I'm doing it for him. You realize that every person you encounter is an opportunity to minister. Every opportunity, every obstacle that comes, it's a challenge. It's something that you can use, you can let the Lord use to build your character. 60% of all employees report being stressed either all of the time or most of the time at work. You know what stress does to your body? Enduring an undue amount of stress, it, it, has a, it would be like somebody beat you with a stick and laid you out in the sun all day. That's the type of emotional drain. Some of you feel that way when you get home from work. That's the way you feel. Listen, that's not, you are not designed to operate on stress. If you will learn to worship while you work and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, instead of getting stressed, come on, you know what's coming, you can be blessed. Now, you should have seen that coming a mile away. That, was, that rhymed, not on purpose, it just happened. 94% of workers report feeling stress at work that they would consider high to unusually high. So you're in a high stress environment. We have we have law enforcement. We have we have all types of we have bankers, we've got moms, we've got co-work, we've got all kinds of workers, farmers, we've got construction workers, we've got hairstylists, we've got all kinds of workers, truck drivers, we've got everybody in the room. It doesn't matter what type of work you're doing, there is the opportunity to be stressed while you do it. You know what the answer is? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And then look at this, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It doesn't say cussing one another out. It says singing to one another. It's making melody in your heart to the Lord. So you kind of have a choice when you walk into work. Are you going to kind of fall into the crowd and, and just kind of be mundane? And, and are, are you going to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly? To dwell in you richly means to be fully alive in you. If the word of Christ is not dwelling in you, then your soul is in a constant state of decay. You, you, you either have the life of Christ, or you experience the death that comes from being in a sinful fallen world. And the sad state for a lot of Christians is, they have a saved soul, but they don't have a satisfied soul. Why? Because they don't know how to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It should be so full, your life should be so full of the word of Christ, there's no room for anything else. There's no, word, there's no room for the complaints or the gossip or any of the mess. It's so funny because you hear people talk about all the time at work, we're not in middle school anymore. Why is that? Well, you, you, you never got out of those bad habits when you were in middle school. Now you don't know what else to talk about except somebody. Right. We're going to get to that more in a minute. Here's what I want you to, to remember. Uh, one last stat. 75% of professionals stated that they think their work stress is having a negative result on the relationships in their life. So what's happening is, is you, not only do you not know how to handle it at work, it doesn't stay at work, it overflows now into the life of your home, and now you're miserable at work for eight hours a day, so the few hours of day that you actually get to spend with the people you really love, now you're going to make them miserable too. So you come in the door, and because your expectations weren't met at work, you expect every expectation to be met at home. And what happens? Well, not only are you miserable, now, congratulations, your whole family's miserable. Well done. No, there's a different way to live. It says here to, to sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. So you let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, that's number one. The second point is you sing and you praise while you work. Everybody remember that old song, In my heart there sings a melody. Na, 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 na. You remember Tommy? Tommy knows that Tommy might be the only one. There's some other people back there giving way. Listen, you, we, I'm not saying that you get to your, to, you, to your place of employment and you open up a karaoke cubicle. Okay, That's not what we're talking about. Do everybody a favor and don't do that. But you know what? Even if they won't allow you to sing out loud, you can still sing in your heart all day long. And here's the truth. The, 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 the song, the tune of your life always follows the melody of your heart. The tune of your life follows the melody of your heart. So if it's constantly a grumbling, complaining, dissatisfied, right? How, how happy do you f expect to feel if all you're singing at work is you can take this job and shove it? You know that whole country song? You can take this. Now, that, how, how do more of you know that song than the Christian song? That, look at it. Everyone's like, I know that one. If that's the melody of your heart, how satisfied do you expect to be? 
Because the tune of your life follows the melody of your heart. That's why, that's why he's saying, and he's saying, look, don't just do it one-on-one. Find some co-workers. Find some godly friends that you can text and send scripture to and call and share songs with and let that just build you up. And everybody else is walking around miserable and you're just walking around. You're just whistling while you go. And what's different about you? I know that was terrible whistling, by the way. You don't, nobody has to point that out. I know. That. Why, why are you so happy? What's different about you? Listen, I'm making melody in my heart because I work here, but this, my life isn't revolved around this job. I'm making melody in my heart because his word is richly in me. I've got so much to be thankful for. I don't have time to complain. That's the truth. If you are saved, You have so much to be thankful for, you shouldn't have time to complain. But for a lot of us, the melody of our heart, it sounds more like a blues song than a worship song. And you need to change your tune. That's what my daddy used to tell me. (laughs) My daddy would tell me. He didn't like what was coming. He said, boy, you better change your tune. I can tune you up real quick. (laughs) No, sir. I'm fine, sir. Thank you, sir. This is a wonderful home, sir. Thank you. And li- did I tell you how great breakfast was? I'm telling you, that Captain Crunch was so satisfied. Thank you, Daddy. Changed my tune real quick, right? It, it, and you have to allow yourself to do that. Now, there's several biblical examples. Remember Noah. Think about Noah. You think you got it hard at work? This guy was building a boat before it ever had rained before. Chances are you're not getting made fun of as bad as Noah was. What are you doing, Noah? Um, well... What are you building? Some kind of bench? Is this a new home design? What is this? I'm building a boat. Why? Ah, just, you know, for when it rains. What are you talking about? It ain't never rained before. Chances are the ridicule you're catching wasn't as bad as him. But you know what? Once that rain did start falling, there was a whole lot of people that wanted to get in that boat. But it was too late. Rejoice now. Celebrate now while you have time. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph led a pagan nation and ensured Israel's survival. Moses encountered God at the burning bush while he was herding flocks, a sheep. He was a farmer and had an encounter with God. David sang songs of praise in the fields. And you know what? It led him, God took him from the field to the palace. And he kept singing all the way along the journey. He even got to kill a few giants in the middle. You know why? Because his heart was full of the word of God. And when everybody else is trembling, wondering how they're going to defeat the battle, the only thing David is saying is, boy, let me get down here and take care of this big fool. All David saw was that he was not in the covenant. He was not the people of God. He was mocking God. He didn't care how big he was or how strong he was. All he wanted to do was to shut that giant's mouth because his word wasn't matching God's word. That's good preaching. Okay, Daniel. Daniel, oh, he, was, he was the CEO of Babylon, oversaw all of the business transaction of Babylon. And you know what? They saw him praying at least three times a day. He was praying on the job. Peter, James, and John were fishermen. Paul was the first freelancer. He was a tent maker. He was self-employed, the apostle Paul, self-employed. What did he do while he was making tents? He was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it didn't matter how bad it got for him. He said, I've learned how to do well with a lot, and I know how to do well with a little. My God shall provide all my needs according to his riches. And then lastly was Jesus. We forget that Jesus was a working man, at least from the time he was 13 when he would have started learning his father, his earthly father's trade until the time he was 30. He was a carpenter working with his hands. And he even used those illustrations in his teaching and preaching. Where did he get the example of the speck of dust and the plank of wood coming out of the eye? Those were carpentry illustrations. He let his everyday experience translate into what he taught and i don't know the bible doesn't say he was a good carpenter but i bet he was i bet he was one of the best because he did everything to glorify god so you can play uplifted music listen if hit kicker 99 7 is the only thing on your dial don't don't question why you got such a bad attitude some of y'all need to let some of that spirit fm in your life Put, put, listen, you know what you can do? You can take, take a scripture verse and put it on the dash of your truck, put it on your desk, put it in your window, put it on your refrigerator, wherever you're working, make sure that you can see that and let that be what you respond to instead of all the negativity. Keep worship on repeat when you're at home. Keep it on repeat, keep it on, let it play all day long. And you'll see your tune will start to change too because you put out whatever you take in. The third thing I would say is work in Jesus' name. I love this in verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, it says, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. You know, some people working at a packaging plant, there's, there's quality assurance, right? 
Somebody has to inspect it. And before it can go out and be sold, it has to be stamped that it was inspected. Let me ask you this. If Jesus inspected your work week last week, would he be able to stamp his name on the performance you gave at work? I'm not talking about whether you did your job right or not. I'm talking about whether you represented him right or not. The words that were coming out of your mouth, were they words that you would find in this book or are they words that you wouldn't want your kids saying? Work in Jesus' name. And you know the way you can do that is avoid the gossip group. Every workplace has one of these. Some of you self-employed, you gossip it all by yourself. You fussing about people talking to yourself. You, you don't get paid to evaluate the life of your co-worker. Did you know that? That's not what you're paid to do. You don't get paid to, to, to analyze the world around you. You get paid to do a job. So do it and do it well and do it in the name of Jesus. You're there to display the glory of God. Don't join in the office pity party. Don't be one of these people that's always talking about, well, I tell you what, they don't pay us enough, and they work us too long, and I tell you, we can't find any half-decent help, and I tell you, it's just all bad all the time. You know what? Give it a rest. Don't join in the office pity party. Instead of complaining about the job you have, celebrate the job you have. Celebrate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Lord, thank you for, for providing my needs. Thank you for these wonderful children. Lord, thank you for, for my parents and for the people that I get to take after. Whatever your job is, celebrate the fact that you have one. I remember when I worked at the jail, I, I was always complaining with Laura, and I, I wanted to go into full-time pastoral ministry. It's what I wanted to do and what I always thought I was called to do. But the Lord had me here in this, in this podunk town working in this backward jail, and, and, and that's what I had in front of me. I complained about it all the time, and I remember talking to a minister friend of mine, Craig Burns, and I said, I just want to go into, into, into full-time pastoral ministry. He said, Dave, can I ask you a question? Why would God promote you to a new ministry when you haven't done anything with the ministry he has put right in front of you? Why don't you start ministering where you are, and then the Lord will worry about where you're headed. But see, you've got to bloom where you're planted. Whatever pot that you're in, you bloom right there. And then when the Lord's ready, he'll pick you up and move you to a different place. He told me, he said, you know, there are people going to seminary for, for eight years to get a degree in marketplace ministry. He says, you're right in the middle of a perfect place to minister. There is nobody at a lower spot in their life than where you're at right now. So minister there. And I started to do that. I started taking pride in what I did. I started working in Jesus' name. I remember we had a, a guy who was in the in the drunk tank one Friday night, and he was going through DTs and alcohol withdrawal, and we were going to have to send him to the hospital. I only had seven people on shift, didn't have anybody to send, and I laid my hands on that man, and I prayed over him in Jesus' name, and he sobered up and went to sleep. Yeah, that's right. And I put it in my report. They had to read about it on Monday morning. They called me in and said, now, Dave, can you explain this to me? I said, yes, sir. Uh, I prayed for him, and the Lord healed him. That's right. um, is there another way that we could say that before? No, there really ain't no other way to say it. That's exactly what happened. And I'm giving God all the glory for it. And you know what? You should be happy because none of you had to come in and cover the shift. The Lord took care of us. And I began to do that and do that. And it got to the point where I realized there is enough ministry around me. I could work in the same spot until the Lord comes back and I'd never be done. And when I settled that in my heart, and I did what was right in front of me in the name of the Lord Jesus, and giving thanks to God, I mean, Lord, thank you. I mean, you all know what they say about the stuff. It always, it rolls down the hill. But you know what? I learned to rejoice with the shovel in my hand. I said, hey, so be it. Lord, this is where you put me. Hey, I'm whistling. I'm shoveling and having a great time. And you know what? As I did that, the Lord began to promote me, promote me, promote me. And I was happy right where I was. And then one day, Antioch Baptist Church came to visit Orange. And the rest is history. You need to work in Jesus' name right now where you're at. Isn't it sad? How the only time most people ever say the name of Jesus is when they're cursing or fussing about something that ain't going right. His name is only to be used to praise. I want you to remember this. The people that you work with are real people. The people you work with are real people. They're, 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 going, they're getting married. They're getting divorced. They're having babies. They have aging parents. They're losing loved ones. They're dealing with empty nests. They're, they're, they're trying to, to be stay-at-home moms and work at the same time. I mean, they're real people. They're not just work people. They have lives. And if you will allow God to use you right where, right where you're at, you can bring the gospel to them in their greatest point of need. But you've got to stop complaining, and you've got to work in Jesus' name. Can Jesus Christ put his name on your day's work? That's the question we should be able to answer. That's the question. 
Treat them with kindness. And yes, all of them. I know that some of them have never done a hard day's work in their life. I know that. I know that the minute you do something right, they're going to try to take credit for it, or they're going to downplay your success, or they're going to talk about you when you turn your back. So be it. Your worth is not based on their opinion of you. So work in Jesus' name. You know, Jesus worked awful hard for a group of people that wasn't very appreciative. Have you read the book? He did an awful lot of work for some people that really didn't appreciate it. But you know what he said? Father, forgive them. See, that needs to be some of your new F word. Forgive. You're really good at dropping the other one. Use forgive. Replace it. Forgive. Oh, I forgive you, brother. (laughs) Oh, God, forgive you. That needs to be your new F word. Father, forgive them, for they know you're laughing, but I know exactly what you were wanting to say to somebody last week. Because I've been there. I've been in those environments. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, is what Jesus said. The people you work with are real people. Work in Jesus' name. Number four is not very popular. Honor your boss. This takes us to verse 22. Honor your boss. Everyone in the room just went, oh, Lord. Don't badger the boss. 35% of workers say their biggest stressor is their boss. I don't care why he's your boss. I don't care whose back he had to scratch. I don't care who he knows. He may be in the good old boy club or she may be in the good old girl club. She, she, may have ten to, she may have 10 college degrees and not an ounce or a lick of common sense. The fact still remains, they're your boss. He or she is the boss. And guess what? You have a choice. You can work hard and make them look good whether or not they deserve it. Or you can kind of join in everybody else and hate on them. Honor your boss. Honor the authority. Look, look what he says. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Now, a bond servant wasn't getting paid as well as you are, I can tell you. It doesn't matter how little you think you're getting paid. In the first century, they were getting paid a whole heck of a lot less. I would love, I, I, I wish I could open up heaven and bring the Apostle Paul back for just one service and let him talk to us. I can only imagine what he'd say. You know what he'd say? Something like this. Stop whining. You're getting paid more than I ever did. Wake up, put a smile on your face, and go to work. Because here's the truth. Now, I ain't going to harp on this for a long time because I know it, it ain't popular. And sometimes we are in really bad work situations. I've been there. It's tough. But here's the truth. You're not really employed by your employer. You really are not employed by your employer. You are enlisted by the king of all the earth. So you're not really working for them. You're working for the Lord, right? And he says, honor them, not just when they're looking. Not just when you get their secret Santa name. Not just when you think it's going to make you look good. No, whenever you work, honor them. Honor the company's time. Do right by your employer, and God will bless you. Don't just do it when people see it, right? And kids love this. Listen, if you're a kid, your job is to be a good kid and be a good student. That's your job. So don't just obey mommy and daddy when they're looking at you. When they go back into the other room, instead of going back to smacking your sister, do what mommy and daddy said you should do. We all are working from from the day we're born. We're wired. We're designed to do it. Honor the boss. All right, number five, work hard. Work hard. Put your back into it. Put a little elbow grease into it. Go the extra mile. Show up early and stay late. Work hard. Hard, because it says whatever you do in verse 23, do it heartily as to the Lord. Do it with a sincere heart because you fear God. And do it heartily because you're not really working for them, you're working for God. Would you work, would you be that lazy if God was standing in the same room? No, but the truth of the fact is, is he sees how lazy you're being anyway. He sees how lax you're being. He sees how, oh, well, you know, I'm going to get paid till four. Uh, There's not really a whole lot to do. We'll just lay off a little bit. Work hard. I remember I worked for VDOT for one summer, and we got finished our little stretch of road, and I made a crazy, I had a crazy idea. Hey, guys, it's barely lunchtime. We got this whole stretch of road done. Why don't we go do another stretch of road? They started throwing rocks at me. Boy, you better go find a tree and hide under it. We ain't, if we, we are not doing another stretch of road. This is all they said we had to do. So this is all we're going to do. I'm sorry. I don't work for you. I work for the Lord. If I have time and if I'm getting paid, I'm going to work hard. 
I remember in the shipyard, we, we, it was a marine electrician and the George H.W. Bush that launched in 2008, big aircraft carrier, wired some of the rooms in there and we would wire a whole room up and then we'd move on to the next room. The whole union came down one day and said, y'all got to stop wiring so many rooms. If you bring these numbers up, they're going to expect all of us to wire these rooms. And I mean, they were going to put people on patrol to make sure we didn't work. Sorry, man, we don't work for you. I don't work for you. You may want to be okay with the status quo, but I'm not. Because I'm working for the Lord, and I'm going to, I'm going to work hard. Now, if you're self-employed and you don't like your boss, well, I don't know what to tell you. If you're self-employed and, and, you're not, and you don't want to work really hard, I don't know what to tell you, right? That should be easier for you, maybe. But listen, whatever we're doing, we should work as unto the Lord so that He can put His stamp on it. it. Your job is not just a career. It's part of your divine calling. What you do at work is part of your divine calling. As a Christian, represent Christ. And if you can't love the job you have, I mean, if you, can't love the, if you can't have the job you want, then love the job you have. If you can't, if, I mean, just love the one you've got. Just try. You know, I mean, we're always complaining. Well, maybe if I went to a different place, I went here, I went there. And it, Listen, love, what you, love the one you got. Try. Just give it your best shot. Because instead of wishing and hoping for something better on the horizon, why don't you make the most of what you have right now? And if you will hunker down and grit your teeth and do that, I guarantee you, God will open up another door. God will open up another door. Because it doesn't matter what human demotes you, you never get demoted in the Lord's eyes. You may not get promoted, but he won't demote you. Work hard. Your satisfaction shouldn't be found in what you do. It should be found in what's been done for you on the cross. You're saved. What else really matters? You're born again. You're full of the Holy Ghost. You, 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 your best days are ahead of you. You've got a mansion waiting in heaven. What else really, really matters? Shouldn't be very much. Your identity is found in Christ. And the last thing I want to say on this point, on working hard, is don't blend in or stand out for the wrong reasons. Don't blend in or stand out for the wrong reasons. If your weekend looked just like your hellion, uh, non-saved co-workers weekend, you have a problem. If you, if, if you sing louder at the office Christmas party and doing karaoke than you do on Sunday morning, you got a problem. If, if, if your life is looking just like the lives of everyone else around you, then you've got a problem. Don't blend in for the wrong reason. We're in the world. We, we, we have similar circumstances that the world has, but we have something the world doesn't, and that's Jesus. So you should, we should blend in somewhat. You don't want to stand out for the wrong reasons either. You don't want to be that weird church-going person that nobody can talk to, that is unapproachable, that is just judgmental, and is always, I mean, you don't want to be, you don't want to stand out for that. You want to be lovable. You want to be teachable. You want to be an encourager. You want to be approachable. You want to be trustworthy. You want to be all of these things. So don't blend in or stand out for the wrong reason. We, we should look at your life and see something different than the unsaved, ungodly co-worker's life. And if we don't, you ain't living right. So don't blend in or stand out for the wrong reason. I'm telling you that. If, you, if you're popping just as many beers on the construction site when the job is over as the other guy who isn't saved, it might be a problem. Think about it. Instead of complaining about your lack of benefits, meditate on your eternal benefits. Can I remind you of what Psalm 103 says in closing? Psalm 103, 1 through 5 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth can be renewed like the eagles. I don't know how bad your benefits package is at work, but I know this, from what I'm reading here from the word of God, your eternal benefits package is pretty good. All of your sins forgiven. All of your diseases healed. Your life redeemed from hell. You're crowned with love and mercy. I may never wear a crown of gold, but I'll take love and mercy all day long. Who satisfies you with good. And you renew your, your youth is renewed like the eagles. Because you know what? Complaining where you're at rarely takes you where you want to go. Complaining about where you are will rarely take you 
where you want to go. When, when, you're bene- when, you, when you're not satisfied with your earthly benefits, meditate on your eternal benefits. And you know what? Be faithful where you're at. Explore opportunities. Get out there and try something new. I'm not saying you can't do any of that, but all I'm saying is, is when you leave a company, you should be rehirable. When you leave a place, you should be able, let me get real now, you should be able to put your old boss as a reference. Why? Because what did Peter say? Whenever they speak evil of you, let your good life shut them up. That's my paraphrase. That's the day vote version. They can talk all the smack they want. My life proves what I believe. When you don't like your earthly benefits, meditate on your heavenly benefit. I used to have such a hard time as a pastor when I first moved here. I remember we went to the pool for a youth night, and God blessed this person at the pool. They said, oh, you're a pastor, huh? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm a pastor. Oh, it must be nice to only work one hour a week. God bless you. I, it's a, you're a, I wanted to take that little man and hoist him, and I could have probably, but maybe thrown my back out, but it would have, the adrenaline would have, I wanted to hoist him up and throw him into the deep end. That's what I wanted to do. But what, you know what, I did, you know, oh, you're right, brother, it sure is a blessing to be where the Lord has placed me. I remember being a corrections officer, and they say, huh, hey, pig, I smell bacon, huh, huh. you like donuts? I said, first of all, everybody likes donuts. Let's be real. That don't hurt my feelings, but how many, I don't know many pigs that are carrying a taser. You say another thing, I'm going to light you up, bro. <laughs> uh, look, every job, it doesn't matter what job that you're in. Stuff's going to roll downhill. All I can say is remember your eternal benefits. Pick up the shovel and shovel with a smile. I remember when Micah was little, and when I didn't work, I had one day off on Saturday, and when I was on, I, I did not want to work at home. But my lovely wife <laughs> would have a list of things she would like to see done around the house. And there was never really a date on there, but it was basically, I want it done yesterday. It was like, you might as well put yesterday's date. And I remember walking around, kicking, I'm fussing, I don't want to do this. I tell you, I work so hard all day long, come home, can't get no respect. I just tell you, I do. and I'm spitting, and I'm cussing, and I'm fussing, and, I'm, and I look behind me, and I see Micah walking, and I'd kick something, and he'd go over and kick something. And I'd fuss, and he'd go, yeah, Dad, it stinks, doesn't it? Yeah, she should have more, yeah. And I was like, whoa, what are you doing, buddy? What are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. This is dad. The daddy's doing the. He said, "Well, dad, I'm just learning from you. I, I want to work like you, dad." I learned from that day. If he sees me dread work, he's going to dread work. If he hears me fuss about my wife, what's he going to do with his wife? If, if, if he sees me hating and dreading the task that's in front of me, he's going to have that same attitude. What I want him to be able to do is what Colossians 3.23 says, that whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all for the glory of God. Do it in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's the end point here. Can Jesus stamp your day's work? You need to pray and fast if, until you can. Maybe you start a Bible study. Maybe you show up early and pray. You know, maybe you, you have that encouraging time. Maybe you, you do whatever you've got to do. But you know what? While you're at work, you need to worship. You need to worship while you work. Because you don't just represent you. You're representing the king of all the earth. You're not really employed by your employer. You're enlisted by the creator of the world. And he will not demote you. That's the good thing about walking with Jesus. He won't demote you. But you know what? You may never get promoted unless you learn to live by the word. The great thing about the Bible, it says this, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And in due time, he will lift you up. When the Lord promotes you, no man can demote you. So remember you work for him and do it all for the glory of God. Would you bow your heads? I want the worship team to come. If you're here today, maybe you say, you know what, Pastor Dave, I, I don't have those eternal benefits that you talked about. I don't have that relationship with God. If you're here and that's true, I want to invite you to to make Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior of your life. Make Him your master. Maybe you're here today and you just say, you know what, I'm just stuck at work. I'm I'm dreading it. I I find no fulfillment. I want to encourage you as we sing this song, Sanctuary. 
that you would make this your prayer. Lord, prepare me to be your sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Make that your prayer and let that prayer turn into a new way of life where you let everything you do be in the name of Jesus and for the glory of God. If you need prayer, please come. Let's stand together and sing. Hello, my name is Dave and I'm the pastor here at Antioch Baptist Church. I just want to thank you for joining us for this time of praise and worship. I hope that it impacted your life and that it inspired you to take your relationship with God to the next level. If you were watching today and you felt convicted by the Lord to accept Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Just say, Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need you to make me new. I invite you into my life to be my Lord and to be my master. I believe that you rose from the dead and I believe that you are the Son of God and I believe that you will return to the earth again to take me home to be with you. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying for my sin. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and if you responded to this message today, we'd love to hear about it. I want you to contact us here at the church and let us know about the impact that it's had on your life so that we can celebrate with you and so that we can give you some resources to help you in furthering your walk with Jesus. Thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you. And remember to love, connect, go, and grow.